So uh, my name is Dave Bradwell. I'm a uh, founder and the chief technology officer and uh, senior vice president of commercialization at Ambry, uh, the company that's commercializing the technology that we initially uh, worked on at MIT with Dish Bonnie Center funding. And what we're working on is uh, grid-scale energy storage, which is truly a transformational opportunity. The electric grid today operates in, in, a, uh, in a manner that the supply and demand are intimately linked. The electricity powering the lights in this room is being produced this very instant somewhere else on the grid. And throughout the day, as more lights are switched on and, and demand increases, generators have to ramp up, turn on, or ramp down to, to meet that change in demand. With low-cost, long lifespan energy storage on the grid, it changes everything. It changes the way the grid can operate. You can now have more broadly, uh, be more broadly dependent on intermittent renewables, such as wind and solar, and be, uh, make more effective use of uh, conventional resources, such as nuclear or coal. And our approach is a radical one. It is a crazy idea, as, as, as Leon said. Uh, it uses three liquid layers uh, at high temperatures that self-segregate and float on top of one another. The initial concept called for magnesium and antimony with a molten salt layer. So the antimony actually pools on the bottom of our crucible. Uh, the molten salt floats on top of that, and the molten magnesium floats on top of the salt layer. And that makes up three uh, components of a battery. And this is unlike anything that's out there today. Uh, this allows us to use low-cost materials that are earth abundant. It's very simple to assemble. And it should last for a very, very long time, because the liquids are very robust, and they don't degrade in the same ways that other electrodes uh, will degrade. During operation, the magnesium, the top electrode is consumed, dissolves into the electrolyte, alloys with the antimony. On uh, recharging, you actually recreate that electrode. So on every cycle, you're, you're effectively electrofining your electrode, uh, purifying it, bringing it back to its initial condition. So we think that this approach can allow us to achieve the goals for this application. Uh, and the motivation for this early on really was to support intermittent renewable energy resources. And uh, as I'm sure you're aware, wind and solar only produce power when it's windy and when it's sunny. And so by using a, a low-cost storage technology, you could absorb extra power when there's, uh, when there's extra wind uh, and then give it back to the grid as required. But there are a lot of other applications for the grid. Uh, Congestion relief, uh, putting storage technologies at the, uh, at the bottom of a congested transmission line or distribution center, uh, frequency regulation, um, as well as just decreasing the, uh, the amount of new capacity you have to put on the grid. Presently, the grid is being built to meet the peak demand that occurs only for a few hours every year. And by putting storage on the grid, you can actually build your grid to the average demand, average requirement for the, uh, throughout the year, and then have storage supply the peaking loads. And that will result in trillions of dollars of investments over the coming decades uh, in energy space. So it's, a, it's a really a massive opportunity. Now, the, the project started many years ago, back in 2005. And as Leon said, the Shabondi Center funded us uh, in 2006. Uh, and that was our, the initial funding. We had uh, this crazy idea, uh, which is just a paper study at the time, and walked into Leon's office and, and with the, the committee there to review our proposal and, and had a literally less, uh, no more than that. Uh, so that, and they, for some reason, decided to fund us, and uh, that it gave us a runway for the next couple of years. And ultimately, based on the results of that work, we're able to attract major funding from ARPA-E and Total, allowing us to grow the on-campus group up to 20 people. So it has more than $12 million of funding going to Professor Sadaway's uh, research lab. Based on that, uh, we uh, ultimately decided we wanted to further accelerate our uh, path to commercialization and commercialized uh, and formed a company, then Liquid Metal Battery Corporation, and now uh, called Ambry. And uh, founded in 2010, we received funding from to Total, uh, Bill Gates, and more recently, Coastal Ventures, who led our Series B financing round uh, this past spring. Uh, along the way, we've received a number of awards, which we're very grateful for, and uh, looking to commercialize in 2014 and beyond. So to give you a sense of how simple the technology is, uh, this is literally how we put cells together. We have a steel uh, pipe, uh, which is four inches in diameter. And, and folks have asked why we used a circular design to start with. And that's because that's what the local pipe supplier had. And we cut it to three and a half inch sections, weld a, 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 a MIG weld a plate onto the bottom, uh, fill it with a metal puck and a salt electrolyte, put a cap on, weld it shut, and we're done. And it's 10 minutes of assembly done in open air. We can use commercial uh, low-grade uh, low uh, metals and salts. And uh, then we take these cells, place them inside of heaters, put heaters on shelves and, and into a battery test stand. And we have 50 channels up and running um, all day, every day um, at Ambry. So you can see it's a very simple approach, uh, 
one of the benefits we've, we've come to realize of this technology is that the need to not spend, have to spend $300 million on a factory to build these things. It's gonna be a much, much different price point of capital investment required to scale this technology. Performance to date has been, uh, been very strong, meeting all of our performance uh, uh, targets. Uh, tested more than 500 cells. Uh, this top graph shows a voltage uh, profile, charge and discharge curves as we're pumping current into the cell, and as it pushes current back out, um, delivering or returning the energy that we, we provided. The, uh, the cells are 75% energy efficient, uh, DC to DC energy uh, efficiency. Uh, note that's at the cell level as we, because it is a high temperature system, we do need to uh, put a bunch of cells together, string them together, and put them in a thermal enclosure to achieve system efficiencies uh, in that range. Uh, we've uh, operated cells now for more than seven months, projections of getting thousands and thousands of cycles, and we continue to demonstrate uh, that and, and pursue that goal. Uh, present efforts, uh, we're shifting our, uh, the laboratory cell design that we, we had initially, uh, moving it towards a commercializable product that we can uh, integrate into a system, and working on components such as high temperature seals and increasing the capacity, efficiency, and lifespan of cells. Uh, on the bottom graph here, I showed the discharge capacity of cells. Uh, of one cell that ran over a several months uh, period. And I want to spend a few more moments on this. Uh, as you may recall, last fall was quite an eventful season. We had a couple, I would say, natural disasters hit Cambridge, uh, including uh, an earthquake, which uh, hit New England. And it was only 4.0, we realized, but uh, this gave us some uh, confidence that even th despite being a fully liquid system, uh, a little shaking on the, on the batteries is, does, not, uh, does not cause problems. Uh, later that month, we had a hurricane come by. Uh, batteries still uh, behaved well. Uh, you can see it retained the capacity uh, from cycle to cycle throughout these events. Uh, but more importantly, uh, there was also power outage uh, in, in November. So it was a, a tough fall season, but the battery kept going through all of it. And uh, even after cooling down from the power outage, heated them back up and got them running again. And uh, they, they behaved, uh, continued to perform very well. So our, our vision for uh, the coming years is uh, take the cells that we're designing, you can see the cell development pathway on the bottom, going from small cells we did at MIT to the lab cells, uh, second from the left, and moving towards a, a smaller uh, form factor square cell so we can pack the cells more tightly together and, and ultimately stack them on top of one another. So take cells, we're gonna put them together into what we're calling our Ambry core, which is a 25 kilowatt hour system uh, comprising of roughly 400 cells. String a couple of these cores together into an Ambry power module. That module will be deployable on its own, or we could string them together into a larger tractor-trailer-sized tractor footprint and deliver megawatt hours of capacity. And so the, over the next couple uh, years, stacking cells, operating prototypes, developing subsystem components, such as battery management systems, uh, and have our first deployment in the field in 2014. Uh, and continue in developing manufacturing partners to allow us to ramp and scale in 2015 and beyond. And so that's our story. Thank you for your time.